Welcome back to our discussion on uh, on, on social media. Uh, we, uh, for those of you who are listening to this, we had originally broadcast yesterday, Thursday, and uh, due to um, you know technology gremlins, we uh, did not record it properly. So uh, we are Alex and I, and I very much appreciate Alex graciously agreeing to attempt to recreate what we talked about yesterday. Um, it's not gonna, so for those of you who were there yesterday, you may wanna to listen to this again, cause it's a whole other discussion, but we will be asking the same questions that were asked. We will be running through some of the, you know, hopefully the same discussions. Um, let me just start with, uh, again, thanking Alex for being here. I've worked with Alex a, a, a long time. Uh, uh, through the McMaster program, as well as um, uh, we've collaborated on a number of studies and are good friends. Just a quick introduction. Uh, Dr. Alex Sevigny is a prof Associate Professor of Communications Management in the Master of Communications Management program offered in partnership by McMaster and Syracuse Universities. He is also Director of the MCM Research Lab and Editor-in-Chief of the Journal of Professional Communication. He has extensive professional experience as both a data scientist and professional communicator. Dr. Sevigny has served as advisor and public relations counsel to elected officials and senior staff at the highest levels of federal and provincial politics, as well with public figures and organizations in the fashion, sports, and culture areas. He has also worked to develop communications and marketing analytics programs for organizations in the public, private, and not-for-profit sectors. Thank you for being here with us today, Alex. Um, just a little bit of background for those of you uh, who are listening. Uh, when this whole COVID pandemic hit, uh, one of the things that Leger looked at is what, what do we have to share to help our clients and other people who we're associated with through this? And uh, information is what we're all about. So we have started with, the, we have our weekly COVID survey that we're doing. Um, some of the results from this week's study is that 60, 63%, or basically two thirds of Canadians, feel that, the, uh, that we should maintain the current pace of relaxing social distancing. They feel that our governments are putting us in a right place for that. Um, Alberta is a little bit off, they're down around 44%, but the rest of the country seems to be on pace at about that two thirds number. Um, and, and overall, you know, we have about seven or eight waves of tracking, and uh, we are now back in terms of how, uh, what fear levels we're at in terms of contracting the virus, we're back at a level that we were at in March. So for the last four or five waves, we've seen a gradual lessening of fear, which to me is a very positive uh, outcome from all of this. Um, one of the studies that Alex and I have done is the social media reality check. It's an 11 year, at this point, analysis of how Canadians are using social media. And we thought for this talk, it would be really interesting to uh, get some updated numbers from where we are at uh, in terms of our social media usage. And the one thing that I find really interesting, Alex, is that generally, the numbers are down. So our usage of social media, the number of platforms we're using, um, the times that we're using it has all changed at this point compared to the last time we did the data about a year or so ago. What's your, uh, what's your take on that? Well, I think it's a couple of things. Um, one is that uh, we, our usual use of social media is structured by our lives. So it's in moments where we have a few stolen minutes we can't do anything productive that we might have planned for ourselves. And so what do we do? We distract ourselves by checking our social media channels. So, you know, during a commute, uh, during a, a break uh, in the morning, during a break in the afternoon, during lunch hour, perhaps just before going to bed, they're not intentional uses of social. Uh, they're um, uh, uses that are structured by by your, your daily agenda. So, uh, I think what we're seeing now is probably a shift towards a more intentional use of social media where people will use it less frequently, but when they look at it, uh, they, they're doing it because they want to. All right, so, so, so less frequently when we want, not when we're necessarily commuting, as you, as you said. Um, 
but then how are we connecting with so if we're using it more intentionally and a little bit less often are we still connecting in the same way with people i think we are i i think uh, what we're doing is rather than sending off random uh, messages or, or communicating by posting co comments to, to posts that we have come across our feed fa uh, fairly randomly because we happen to log on at that time. What we're doing is we're logging on because we want to be on, because we want to consult a certain person's page, because we're interested in what they're doing, and then we're commenting more intentionally, we're sending SMS messages. Now, on the other hand, I think a lot of the traffic uh, of interpersonal communication that ha that has moved on to digital platforms isn't necessarily on social. Um, it's I think it's on um, uh, other digital platforms like teleconferencing, such as the one we're using now, or or uh, Zoom, or GoToWebinar, or whatever your you uh, organizational uh, platform you use. And I think that's a good point. So what we did collect some data and we find that 83% of Canadians, which to me is a huge number, 83% personally have used some form of video chat uh, recently. So that's either Zoom or, or GoToMeeting like we're on or Skype or FaceTime. There has been some sort of personal video connection. And again, that's 83% of people who have, are online. Obviously there are people who are not able to access the internet. Um, but that, that's a huge number to, to, to show that number. And I understand that we would be substituting some social media for that, but it's great to see that people are still connecting through digital channels this way. I agree. Um, it's, it's more of a personal connection than you would have had via social media. It's less public. Um, and there's less of a, there are fewer avenues to reach those people. Uh, if you're an advertiser or uh, a professional communicator working for a brand or an organization. So that's a challenge you have to, to work around. Uh, however, um, what that means is that your strategy on social networks is all the more important because when people are on there, it's because they want to be and they're paying attention. Yeah, that's a good point. So, so that's personal. What about professional? Because there's a couple of different ways that uh, social media is used. One is for uh, staying in personal contacts, the other is through professional means, and the third would be as a source for news. Let's get to news in a second, but what about professionally? If I have a business, how should I be using social media right now? How should I be in the same way I always have, or should I be doing something differently? Well, I think that the key element here is to remember that this COVID-19 pandemic crisis moment is very salient for people, which means that it's strongly marked. And so if it's strongly marked, they're paying attention to it. They're experiencing it. If they're experiencing it, they're going to remember it. It's going to be a part of their life history. So whatever communications you do during this time are going to be much uh, more cognitively available, much uh, more highly marked for uh, the people that you're communicating to. So you have to, we want to make sure that the, your brand association that they're making during this crisis time that's so important to them, it's going to be a big part of their lives that they're going to tell stories about probably for the rest of their lives to their friends and family. You want to make sure that those associations are positive. Okay, so but what about organizations and uh, like, like, like tourism? where we're not able to, uh, and we have some specific questions that were asked around different business sectors, but let me ask about tourism. I, I can't travel, I can't do anything, I can't even go to national parks right now. So how do, if I uh, have a tourism site, how do I maintain that connection? What, what should I be talking about, talking about, do you think? You know, tourism is something that people look forward to. And I think one of the best things that your a brand can do right now, during a time when people are in confinement or um, you know self isolation or whatever uh, experience they're having at the moment of not being able to socialize and get out and travel, is they want something to look forward to. They want something to make them dream about. They want something to remember, right? So I think what you do is you present memories, you present uh, images, you present a narrative that is heartwarming, is optimistic, is something to look forward to, so that when, uh, so they, so you fix the, uh, uh, a thought in their mind about the future, 
so that when rather than sitting here and being depressed and glum, you know, you get something interesting from from uh, this brand, from your brand, which is promoting uh, some kind of tourism in a gentle way. But rather than promoting it by through you know through price competition or or through um, through uh, uh, through pricing or through something more uh, more hard nosed, you promote it through creating um, a, a, a virtual experience, and that that gives that person something to dream about, to look forward to. You become a, a positive association so that when, when COVID lifts, they're going to think, oh, now I want to fulfill that dream. So uh, we had a question yesterday um, from uh, from Regina, the, uh, the unfortunate uh, place of the Saskatchewan Rough Riders. And I say that because one of the people on the line was uh, from the from my hometown team, the Winnipeg Blue Bombers. But we'll still ask the answer to the Saskatchewan question. And that was about what do you do with sports teams? I mean, is it the same thing, same advice that you would give to tourism for sports teams? Because obviously we're not able to watch sports right now, or would you add a little bit to that? I think it's a little bit of a different answer. Uh, and I think that uh, some organizations have been doing, and players have been doing a good job with this. Uh, some better than others, obviously. Uh, you know, we have our, our Tiger Cats here in Hamilton that we're so proud of. <laughs> I get an plug for them too, sure. <laughs> um, but uh, the, uh, I think what, you, what, what players have been doing right is maintaining a relationship with uh, the people that pay attention to them on social, their fans, the people that like them, et cetera. Um, and they've been doing it a couple of different ways. They've been doing it through public service announcements, um, also offering encouraging messaging, and thirdly, showing that they're impacted as well. And I think that that component of the shared experience during a moment that everybody is experiencing here is key. You know, um, the, the, I think the last thing that you want to do is be, you know, only all business when you're when you're an athlete, public figure, somebody involved in fashion, arts, or culture. I think that you can group all that together in a sense, right? Because those are all public figures and people that uh, that um, the viewers or the or the their audiences feel a certain emotional connection to. So I think you want to open up and say, look, I'm affected by this too. Um, you know, wash your hands, all the public service announcements that that, that are necessary. Um, and you know, talk about exciting moments, present clips. You know, I mean the NBA is doing a very nice job of showing showing great games and and um, capturing their, their their clips in the past. And then again, hopefully, but realistically, talking about what's to come. So people don't feel like, oh, it's never gonna come back, forget about this, it's too painful, I'm a fan, and, and, and I don't even think about the, you don't want that. You don't want people to say, too painful. You wanna, you want them to, to feel good about it so that they know that in, in months, in the months that come, it's gonna come back and they can be all enthused about it. Okay. Um, another specific to an industry, but um, this question is, I work for a nonprofit who relies on donations from the community. Uh, they're hesitant right now to continue to ask for donations. Are they right to be hesitant or should they continue to be asking for donations to, to keep them afloat? I think it's absolutely okay to ask for donations to keep, the, to keep uh, your organization afloat because that uh, this, you know, the hardship that a not-for-profit is experiencing can 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 feel akin to that which uh, the the the, donate, the donating public might feel as well. Uh, but I think it's what's key is to show that your organization's members, staff, volunteers, uh, leadership are experiencing the crisis as well. That you're not a faceless, um, you know, bank account that they're just sending stuff to. That makes stuff happen somewhere else. Uh, rather, you know, open up uh, your organization's lives a little bit. Well, not too much, obviously, but you know, in an appropriate fashion. Um, and show show your your donors or potential donors or the public that uh, you're affected, that that you care, um, and that uh, you're somehow contributing in a relevant way uh, to to uh, the solution. That makes sense. What um... But can you communicate too much? And I think I'm going to go, you know, I'm, I'm, in my mind, I'm thinking about all those emails we got uh, at the beginning about this is what our organization is doing and we care about you and our employees and here's our next plan. The first few, it was very nice. The next 20 or 30 was 
a little bit much. So, but so can we be talking too much through social during this? Should we be put, pulling back a little bit? What do you think? I think you can talk too much about certain things. And uh, those emails that you refer to, I, I got them as well. And at first I thought, wow, what a nice touch, right? Yeah. But after a while, like it, like you said, after the 27th one, I, I was kind of like, okay, I, I get it. Um, but uh, for me, they've fallen into three categories. Well, one category is um, where a company is sort of summarizing the news, basically summarizing with the PM and what your provincial premier has been saying about the lockdown and, and, and medical officers of health. Um, and the second category is, is kind of, uh, you know, uh, giving you a glimpse into what the organization itself is going through. And the third category is actually interacting with the public and, and giving interesting and, and, and positive uh, experiences that can be shared. So, I mean, one brand that I, um, um, one retailer that I uh, am partial to has been, had a beautifully executed uh, email campaign uh, throughout COVID where uh, they feature different activities that you can do where you can express your creativity. So one of them was creativity with children, another one was creative, so it was arts and crafts and different types of things. Another one was personal creativity for, for uh, uh, adult uh, people uh, doing different uh, maker type activities and featuring people, featuring the customer, but in a very non-invasive, very light touch. And it was lovely. And I, strangely enough, I look forward to those emails. The third category um, is probably the, the, the least effective. And that is when an organization has taken it upon themselves to become a sort of newswire. And, uh, you know, um, they're basically, I have two or three organizations that have been sending me, uh, these are, uh, commercial organizations have been sending me businesses that sell stuff. I, bet, I don't want to name them. <laughs> have been sending right. me, uh, you know, it's a, have been sending me uh, emails where they say, "Here's what the premier said. Here's what the prime minister said, and here's the top news of the day." And I was thinking, well, thank you, but other news gathering organizations do a better job of this. Uh, it's not really within your wheelhouse. Why are you doing this, and why are you sending me a daily email? Uh, my daily briefing. Uh, you're, yeah. you're, you're, you're not necessarily credible to do that, right? Yeah. So, which which is an interesting thought because because when we asked people about where you know uh, where are you using social media to get your news, the number is down from what we would normally see in our study. Um, and generally, people are looking to TV for a lot of their information right now. It's it's. So for the first time in a long time, TV is up, social media is down on this. And I think you you shared with me the other day some interesting stats around uh, new sharing. Maybe you could share that for the audience as well. For sure. Uh, I think that what's happened is because the Prime Minister in particular has, has done a, a daily briefing and the Premiers have done daily briefings, I think some of them or most of them have, at least yeah. uh, where I am in Ontario, uh, Premier Ford has certainly been doing that. Um, and those briefings are effective and they're widely viewed by the public and people are at home so they have the time to sit and watch tv at 11 a.m and then a little bit later in the afternoon um, that's probably where they're getting most of their updates right you know quote unquote right from the horse's mouth um, but uh what, oh, yeah for in another study that i do for another client which is interesting or a partner organization which which is interesting is is um we measure the reach of mainstream media articles on social media and so uh, that's to say how many times will an, an article published in uh, from a large publisher like CBC or uh, CTV or uh, Global or Globe and Mail or Toronto Star or whatever uh, how many times is that article shared by individuals on social media and uh, it's really interesting because uh, that has declined enormously right so uh, we buy about two-thirds actually during the crisis and it's progressively declined throughout the crisis as well so we've seen a, a downward slope on, on that curve uh, where uh, people are sharing mainstream media articles less on social now that's likely because there there's less passive use of social so there it's less social uh, media use while you're on the train and there happens to be an article that comes by, you read the headline, you read the first paragraph, interesting, I kind of agree with that, share, or retweet, right. or whatever. 
that's, I think, been taken off the table because now what people are doing is, okay, I've had my lunch, I'm feeling calm, I want to see what's going on on social media, they log on. But instead of it being one of 12 or 15 logins during the day, it's one of three perhaps. And, and, and because they're being intentional, they're taking the time to read every article, so they're sharing a, a, a lesser volume of mainstream media articles, would be my hypothesis. Yeah, I think that's, I think that's a good hypothesis. So this, this whole part about sharing news, though, and sharing information. So we had a question from a healthcare uh, communicator who basically is saying, you know, our role right now, to a large part, is sharing information what to do, what not to do, how to take care of yourself, how to wash hands. These, these core concepts of news or information that we need to get through this. But at the same time, how do they use or can they even be thinking about using social media to build and expand on relationships? So does the information versus emotional relationship aspect of it have to be kept separate or is there a way for them to to grow the relationships with their community that they have at the same time? Yeah, that was a very good question. I, and I think now more than ever uh, is the time to take to heart the, the idea that your social media use is very strategic and should be um, run in a strategic fashion, right? And, and putting it into two buckets of you know, informa useful information versus, um, versus uh, um, uh, emotional is, isn't necessarily the way to do it because if you think about it people are in a crisis moment they're reading social to get it to get informed but also to be entertained to be to be uh, distracted etc from from whatever's going on in their life at that moment so more, now more than ever they're thinking of your brand as a, as a person as an individual so when you're communicating to them now um, they're thinking, oh, look, uh, this shoe uh, ret retailer is, is communicating with me, and they're feeling it as if it was a person. Um, so what I would suggest is that you create a narrative where you bring useful information and an emotional connection where you talk about how your organization is responding to and being affected by the, uh, the crisis together in some kind of conversational fashion. Right, where where really what you're doing is you're you're building a relationship with your audience rather than broadcasting to them, which I think the the strategy uh, in in many sectors before this has been social media as a form of sort of uh, one to many or many to many broadcasting, um, and and I, I really think that now is the moment for you to have that. It, the moment is 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 ripe and open because people are in this special moment and they're they're everything is changing. You can take advantage of that change to actually build a human relationship with your clients in a way that uh, you you may not have been able to before. Well, and, and and everything is changing, and we have we're doing another study that's talking about the new behaviors, especially online behaviors, are do people are doing, and there for a lot of people we're doing new things. We're ordering from. Uh, takeout services or, or food delivery services, we're ordering online, things that we may have never done before and we're starting to say that we're going to continue to do that. So there's this shift beyond communication, there's this general shift to an online world. One of the questions we had yesterday was about um, digital discrimination or social media discrimination as organizations and we move to start communicating and giving info and building relationships online how do we make sure we're not leaving anyone else behind because there are a group of people who uh who, there's a group of people who just don't want to be on the internet there's a group of people who uh for a variety of reasons uh access uh socioeconomic just cannot be on the internet how do i as an organization make sure i'm not leaving these people behind and only communicating with um, a digital audience you know what? That's a very good question, and I think it's a it's one that is highly sensitive because there are mm -hmm. large large areas of Canada which have limited broadband and the cellular uh, connectivity, right? And although the, for the vast majority of Canadians who live in, in urban centers, large urban centers or smaller urban centers, that might seem unimaginable. There are people who don't have cell phone access in 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 many parts of Canada, or who have very weak cell phone access. Uh, or who and who have no access to broadband. Um, so that being said, um, 
And, and also within urban communities, there are people who refuse to use the internet, of course, for, for various reasons. And then there are people who, again, uh, uh, often for lack of personal resources, don't have a subscription to, to uh, broadband, or who only use uh, the consult the internet at the public library. And they can't go to the public library net right now. That's a really uh, good because, point. Yeah, that's a very good yeah. point. Yeah. Uh, and, and so all of these people are very quietly being left out, right? And that is not good for your brand, right? Because you're not reaching them. So I think one of the, the loveliest gestures that you can do, and I think that it would be met with heartfelt approval, is you give some of the, the, the you give your, your audience a mission to reach out to those folks and to spread whatever information you have to give to them, to the people who they know who aren't connected to the, uh, to the internet, either by choice or by, by circumstance, right? And, uh, you, and you, you kind of give them the message, the messaging that you hope that they will disseminate. And, you know, given that this is a, a, a challenging time and people do have extra time on their hands, um, that, um, that is, they're likely to do that. Um, and I, I just want to say here too that the key is know your audience, right? Yeah. So, so I mean that's where market research comes in into into play. Um, and you know because you want to know what percentage of people uh, in your in your catchment or your your various uh, audiences uh, are unlikely to have good access. You want to know whether you whether the people who have access talk to those people, and that's. Uh, that's that's easily discovered, but it's, it has to be discovered by somebody who does the research. So, so it's uh, really worth the investment. And just to get back to a previous question that you asked me, there's a piece I left out that I uh, and you, you said, can you over communicate? Can you um, get the message wrong? And I think again here, the same message I just said: you have to know your audience. Uh, and what when I said you should have a senior, uh, sorry, you should have a strategic approach and somebody who knows what they're doing strategically running your social um, and planning your social, that planning should be based on data and evidence. So you should be listening to what your, uh, your um, subscribers or followers are, are, are saying and doing. What are their stories? Who, who is being strongly affected? Um, do, uh, you know, if you cater largely to, for example, to a, a female audience, right? Uh, a lot of people don't know uh, or aren't perhaps as uh, sensitive or familiar with the the so sensitive to or familiar with the idea that many um, women have been uh, struck hard by this because uh, it, by dint of their their personal circumstances they are responsible for childcare and uh, often uh, household care uh, as well as having a full time job and that's been moved home. Um, and, and now they're working through a digital platform and their kids aren't at school because the school's shut down. Yeah. So it's enormous emotional pressure. It's a very hard moment for those people. And so if, if that demographic is a, a big part of your uh, audience or your clientele, you want to know that. And if you can send out a supportive, validating, positive message to those people, uh, I think that would be very well received. And, and that's one example. There, there, there are others, right? And you just want to be aware of that kind of thing. Well, and, and thank you for the plug for market research. Uh, but, but I also, and I think that also applies to B2B audiences. It's really about know your audience and know when and how much to communicate. And the more you know about them, the better you're going to be able to build those relationships with them right now. Um, so a quick speed round. We have a couple of questions to ask uh, right at the very end here. Um, in terms of uh, retailers, there's some uh, question was asked about there's retailers are in Quebec are starting to open up in Ontario. We're starting to see storefront places opening up. Um, should there be a hesitation to do a lot of promotion about being open uh, because you don't want to overwhelm with too many people showing up or is it okay to start talking about your store is open and come visit us? Like do does a retailer have a uh, I guess a social uh, ethical position where they shouldn't be trying to attract people to their store just yet even though they're open? Um, you know what I think that um, retailers should definitely welcome people back to their stores, but they should do it in a in a in an ethically ethical and responsible fashion, which is to say, you know. Um, 
to share the experiences that they are going through, that their employees are going through, and to share the special uh, adaptations that they've had to make, to the measures they've had to take to, to provide a safe workplace to their employees, as well as a safe place to shop for the, uh, for the general public. And that's maybe uh, to remind people that they should be, um, that their employees are wearing PPE for a reason and, and that, uh, and that uh, uh, customers should also take measures like possibly wearing masks or gloves or whatever, you know, and encouraging um, them to think about social distancing when they come to the store or come to the garden center or, or whatever. Um, I think that all of those things um, can be delivered in a friendly, uh, positive, kind of health positive fashion that doesn't sound preachy, and, and, uh, but you can still be inviting people to the store for sure. Okay. Um, so the last question, and I, I kind of like this one, many food manufacturers are waiting to launch new products. So they have, we have things in the pipeline as a food manufacturer ready to go. Um, I would normally have you in the grocery store doing a tasting, or I would do some sort of event to gather a crowd, which I don't want to do now. So instead of launching these new foods the way I normally would, do you see social media as, as, a, as a strategy to introduce the new products? Absolutely, because it's, yeah. it's, it's a way of, of, of building a relationship with an audience. Uh, there are lots of technologies now you can use to, to bring people close to the product. You can use 360 video, you can, you can create certain augmented reality experiences. You can, you can have a lot of fun and be very creative during a time when people are really paying attention because they're using social media intentionally. So I would say, yeah, it's a great time. All right. So thank you again, Alex. Uh, for those of you who have listened for the second time around, maybe, it's been a little bit different. Um, we didn't ask all the questions that you asked, but we kind of paraphrased and covered off the information, at least, that people had uh, before. And um, when technology fails, I'm glad that Alex is there to come and help us uh, help us recreate our conversation. We should try it again tomorrow and see how it changes again, Alex. Just keep on doing the same, this Groundhog Day conversation every day for the next little while. But, you, took, uh, but, you, took, you took the words in our mouth. I was going to say like Groundhog Day. <laughs> it's a Groundhog Day thing, yeah. So thank you very much and uh, have a great day. And uh, for those of you who are still on the line in two weeks, we're going to take a week off. Uh, but in two weeks, we're going to have Dr. Tina McCorkendale come on and talk about internal communications and how uh, what employers are doing during this and what we really should be doing, especially as we start looking at the, the back to the office, back to the workplace type of uh, discussion that's going to be coming up. So thank you, everyone. Thank you again, Alex, and uh, have a great day. My pleasure. Thank Bye. you.